Hello, Vincent. Hello, how are you? Good, good. Thank you for joining us today and, and for everybody that joined us. So we're going to go ahead and get right into this. We have a, a limited amount of time, a lot of important information to go over. So uh, my name is Chad Ramberg. I am the president and co-founder of Box Professional Insurance. Uh, what we do here is we help advisors, financial services industry with their business insurance, e and RIA, fiduciary liability, all of that stuff, cyber insurance, okay? Uh, Vincent is the founder and chairman of Buckler. So Vincent, thank you for joining us today. We're honored and really appreciative to have you here. Pleasure, Chad. Thank you. So the reason uh, somebody said, well, why in the world was an insurance brokerage firm asking Buckler to come in and help give this information. And the key thing is we think that the best brokers actually are out there helping reduce client risk, not just shifting that risk by buying insurance. And the key thing to know is we're actually a client of Buckler. Okay. So we chose with this New York DFS, you know, last year we were looking into it and we connected with Buckler and they've helped us get a really strong compliance stance. And we uh, decided to, to make sure and help help get this out to the industry so that you can find this information hopefully helpful for those that are our clients and those that may be our clients someday. Uh, the, the three things that we want you to be able to take away from this at the end is to be able to say, you know, what's the best next steps for you? That may be, hey, I'm all good. We're set. It may be I need help every step of the way or somewhere in between. That's what the goal of this is. And so that's what we're gonna week through, work through on this. And I, I think we'll be able to get there, Vincent. Thank you so much. Let's go into why should we care about New York DFS and having a strong cyber compliance stance? It's gonna be surprised because two words that are important and you see the question here. So what we saw in the past, and that was one of the trigger to create Buckler, is advisors were going through a breach. So then suddenly the regulators are coming or the authorities, especially the FBI. And what they ask is a little bit surprising, but they want to know if you're compliant. Do you meet regulation or are you negligent? And that's what we call the second victim. So imagine you have a first a breach and you say, wow, I'm a victim of a breach. And then you call the for help. And then suddenly, if you're negligent, you're, you're a victim again there. So the goal here is to say, okay, how can I prepare for that? And the word is really preparedness. So there's three things that can happen to you and you have to protect yourself against. So the first one is an exam. We saw the transition from just before COVID to now when a regulator sent a document to a firm and said, we're coming to audit you, you have to answer all these questions. I saw document from few pages to now 20 pages, which really details requirements. And we'll cover a little bit about that later. So during an exam, you wanna be ready. So prepared to answer those questions. During a breach, same thing. And now back to you, Chad, because you're in insurance. What we saw, especially since COVID, is cyber insurance claim, huge change on that side. So can you share a little bit what you see, Chad, in the industry regarding those points here? Yeah, so what we're seeing as far as premiums in the industry, and just broadly speaking in the cyber space, it's all over the board, okay? And, uh, you know, it's been one of these things that obviously since, you know, the 60s, we've had computers, but, you know, in the 80s and the 90s, in the early 2000s, cyber insurance really come into play. And, and the, the, what it was initially was they said, you know, 6,000 bucks just to get a policy and it covers almost anything cyber. And then as it's developed over time, they've constricted the, what's actually being covered, defined it better, and the prices went down a little bit. Then, you know, five, six years ago, we started seeing a massive increase in, in claims, okay? And, and part of this may be state actors being involved, more sophisticated uh, folks knocking on the door, trying to break in, you know, digitally and what have you. And so it's just gotten really messy. And there's been, uh, you know, at one point, Lloyd's got sued for this, this huge cyber claim and, and it froze the market up a couple of years ago where underwriters weren't even offering terms. There was two or three month period there. Okay, so it's all over the board. It's hard to say exactly what's happening when because cyber is a fast moving market. There's a bunch of things going on. The biggest concern once you have a claim is first, 
getting that taken care of. But then we come up with, are we going to get a good renewal? Uh, is the claim going to be denied? You know, the work we need to put into that before that happens is making sure we have really good coverage in place. So there's a little bit of history on the cyber insurance side of it. Tell me, Vincent, a little bit of history on what you're seeing in the compliance side. Yeah, it's just to help to understand, we're going to get to New York in a few minutes. But just before, if we look at the history, you know, if you start in 2000 and it goes from left to right, obviously, you may consider protecting your endpoint. In the 10, 2010s, you know, you should protect your endpoint and now you must. So you see the difference in regulators from really vague to strongly prescriptive. So suggesting a vague prescription, you should put a protection on your endpoint. Or even at some point, we're saying you should put an antivirus. Now it's endpoint protection with antivirus, anti-malware, ransomware protection, behavioral analysis, AI, and endpoint detection and response. So imagine the difference now when you have to look at what am I going to do to meet the regulation. And the last one is my favorite. Before, they didn't ask anything. And then they were asking you to say, yes, yes, I comply. And if you look now, especially for New York DFS, it's a law. You have to go individually to certify that you meet the regulation, but more than that, that you have the evidence to prove it. And just to give a little bit also of the, the standards of the framework that are built around this NIST, you all heard about it, and it's a great framework. But what we see now, which is winning a lot of momentum, is the zero trust maturity model. So CISA created this. I invite you to go online, download that PDF. It's fabulous. But if I summarize it, it's really to say that there's five pillars and we cannot work in silos anymore. We have to cover everything from users with their identity, authentify them, devices, protection, obviously, network inside the office and outside. Application, we're talking about hardening services. How do you configure an application so it's secure? And the, the, the data, obviously, should be encrypted, but now avoiding data exfiltration. So how do I protect that nobody can take the data from an area and put it online somewhere? And now what's interesting with Zero Trust model is the integration of all this together. So there's solution to cover that. Yeah, so what's what's interesting there is there's the cyber regulation and the cyber program or your risk, your cyber risk stance, right? And what we see is when we're looking at cyber insurance, we're seeing kind of a handshake, an informal handshake between the regulators and the carriers. And what I mean by that is the regulators put the laws into place and the underwriters at the carrier side are asking you questions and assuming that you are meeting those regulatory requirements in whatever jurisdiction you're in. Okay. Now what happens is some of this stuff you're probably doing already, but with the escalation of the proof of it, it kind of changes the nature of that because it used to be, if you checked a box, yes, on your cyber application, and a claim never came up and you weren't doing it, well, that might have been a mistake, but it's not a huge deal. Now it comes into, you may have a problem with regulatory issues and that may affect your cyber insurance coverage and, and it's all can get a challenge from there. So we wanna make sure that all these components are working well together. So when regulators look at it, our cyber program is strong, it connects together. And then in the event of a breach, or an attempted breach, we know we've got as strong as strongest situation we can. Totally agree, Chad. And if you look, because what we have access to from New York EFS is a regulation. Okay, so how do we get from there to the cyber program, Chad? So a regulation, I invite you to download the document. It's a legal document with specific terms and a lot of different regulations use different terms, you know, audit trail. What is an audit trail, you know, compared to a log as an example? But here we have New York DFS, so we take this and you cannot just say, I'm applying what's in there. Because if you look at it, New York DFS covers all those major areas. How do you manage your risk into the organization? How senior leadership is involved? And we'll get back to this now because it's changing. Information security policy is all your safeguards and technical controls to protect data. The others, I'm thinking you all know them. I don't like to talk about that. But the regulators are telling you, look at these sector and look at my document and then create your own cyber program. And that is the challenge. It's not just the policies that typically we see the firm must protect the endpoint, but then it's the procedures. And they clearly said, analyze your risk based on your firm, your size and your risk. 
develop your own system internally to meet regulation. So I have to do procedures. So if I say, yes, I have to decommission, I'm sorry, decommission a computer when I get rid of it, what are the procedures? Okay, I'm going to open a ticket. I'm going to track it. Somebody will approve it. And I'm going to track until it's destroyed or erased. You know, I erase the data on the disk as an example when in a specific way. And then the task reviews. So not only I have to do this, but I have to review that it's actually done. And some of these policies needs to be approved. Okay, before they're done, or as an example, approving your overall cyber program. And finally, what we call an active cyber program is to track the evidence that you comply. So you have the regulations there, but you have to create your own cyber program. That is where Buckler really helped box professional insurance. We were doing a lot of those earlier steps in there, okay? But Buckler really be able to pull it all together to have that evidence of compliance, make sure that not only are we saying we're doing these things, we're doing these things, we've got the evidence, we can show it to the regulators. Yeah. Of course, we have cyber insurance, all that. That's what Buckler helped us do. Uh, and Just had to mention you that. Think about it, Chad. That's why we created Buckler because everybody, every firm like you, your clients, everybody on the call, they all need to create the same system so that when we saw this, we say, let's create it, you know? Yeah. So who's who's joining today? Really, we have a broad swath. Most everybody who's joining, I believe, is in the financial services sector, but we have everything from a small or relatively small financial advisor, maybe 20, 30 million in assets under management up to multi-billion dollar with hundreds of, of registered reps or IARs. And, and that, so that's a broad swath. So can you kind of help us when we're thinking about that, Vincent, you know, who, yeah. you know, what are the different pieces of, we have a big audience. So first How I want to thank, to I want to thank everybody because we have like, we had 200 registrations. So Everybody from all the, the spectrum here is involved in cybersecurity. So our clients, people we work with, you know, either the CISO, Chief Information Security Officer, we'll cover that, senior leadership. But then we have people coming from compliance. The CCO said, oh, I have that hat. I have to manage cybersecurity. Sometimes it's coming from technology that say, we don't have a compliance person, but I am the one responsible for this. And we have a lot of people in small firm that is an operation or an admin, somebody that is not CISO or CCO, but get the role and needs to work in there. So I think that's that's the challenge from be able to serve all this, this different group of people. But one thing for sure, whoever they are, they have to be playing the role of the CISO. So the CISO should be, according to New York DFS, either an employee Okay, so now you have no choice. I have firm who's your CISO and they tell me I don't have one. According to the law, you should have a CISO. So please pick somebody and name them the CISO. You can outsource the role. Okay, there's some VCSO that can be, uh, you, you know, ask for help, but you still need one senior executive at the firm responsible for the oversight and the direction. So that's really interesting to understand that that role now is you cannot not do it. You, you really have to do it. Yeah, Vincent, what's what's the urgency with this? I mean, we know there's some timelines, but why is this an urgent situation and, and what do we need to keep in mind about that? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that uh, uh, the first thing is the change in the momentum of cybersecurity in politics, okay? In the past, cybersecurity, when they were launching a new regulation, there's a press release, there's a website, and there's some announcement. But this one, the Second Amendment of New York was launched with a press release from the governor. So that's something totally different. Uh, John Cooney talked about it. There was a webinar in New York DFS with Paula Subird uh, lately from Security Basecamp. And John Cooney, which is a, a specialist lawyer in uh, cybersecurity, noted that that's new. And he never saw that in that career. So I just want to quote him because it, I didn't make that. Uh, but now I understand the difference. So you see that they're going to enforce and they're going to be more strict about what they're trying to do. So when you talk about the emergency, that's what is new. It's before annually on February 15, for New York DFS, you had to go online. And I remember clients doing it and they would just go, anybody in the company goes, I say, yeah, yeah, we certify. You know, that was it. So now look at the difference. You have to go and certify that you meet all the regulations, which is rare that somebody meet New York DFS fully and completely. And now you have to say which requirements of New York I am meeting and which one I don't meet. So you have to document this. So imagine taking a document like the regulation and say, okay, half of it I do, half of it I don't. 
what do I do? I need a remediation plan. I need to explain to New York DFS what I'm going to do to meet your requirements and when. And the last line is really important, which is new. So now two people, it could be the same person, but two people should go and certify the highest ranking executive. So now people on the call, if you're not in the senior leadership, you have to involve those people and tell them that it's coming and they have to be involved because they're personally going to certify and also the CISO. So imagine if, if I'm a solo advisor and I have an RIA, I'm going to play those two roles. But as soon as there's multiple people, you're going to have to identify who's doing what. So that's becoming really, really important. You know, in the financial services space, Vincent, when I see exempt, I say, OK, this is great. I must be exempt. We're a boutique firm. We, we do really good, uh, but it's a very focused area. So if I'm exempt, fantastic. So what does it mean to be exempt? And, and what did I miss when I first read that? OK, so first, it's, it's, there's a lot of confusion around it. So we try to butlerize the, 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 the requirements there. So we build a table, you know, and we say, OK, so let's put them from left to right. OK, so we're going to start from the first one. OK, so full exam. So full exam means that you are under another cyber program. So maybe you have a parent company, a holding company, a partner. It could be somebody that you work with. You just said, I'm under their program. So suddenly you realize that you have to make sure that they have a program that meets regulation because you're at risk. That's the first thing to do. The second one is, what does it mean to be examined? I talk to people and they say, I have nothing to do. That's not exactly what it says. It says that because you are full exam, you do not have to create your own cyber program. But believe me, if you're under the cyber program of somebody else, you have to do what's in that program. So if you need to do everything that you see on the left, somebody from that firm will do it for you or you will still have to do it. So if they say you have to run a vulnerability scan of your network and that parent company that you're under doesn't do it for you, you have to do it. So please, please, when somebody tell you, oh, you're exempt, you're fine, don't think you have nothing to do. First thing I want to say, the second thing is, if you're in your DFS, you may also be SEC, FINRA, or other regulation. You have to make sure that you may have to do it for another regulation. The second one is interesting, you know, limited exam without NPI. So if I don't have NPI and I'm not covered under another, so I'm not number one, I may have just to meet some of the requirements, but then I have to notice. So on April 15, I have to go file. On the first column, I don't have. Okay, so here I will have to go certify that I'm meeting the three section that are highlighted here. So that's the limit. And Vincent, so we make sure and remember MPI is? Non-public information, I'm really sorry. It was called PII before, which was really restricted to personally identify information. PII is everywhere, still in all documentation. They extended it in 2017, non-public information, which suddenly it's not just the information of your client. It's anything non-public. So it could be your own credit card, your bank account, everything confidential in the firm now is covered there. Good point. Thank you. So now we have, I would say one third of our client will follow this. They say, look, I'm in California. I have a big business. I have two clients in New York. I'm limited exam. Okay. But if I'm a CC, I still have to do most of the requirements that are there. So this is great for a state regulated RIAs or a small agency that has limited number of clients in New York. You see less than 20 employees, less than 7.5 million revenue, or 15 million of assets in the New York state. And so, as I understand it, just to make sure, this is not 15 million assets under management. This is 15 million of assets in the balance sheet. Yes, exactly. What you okay. own, buildings or whatever you own. You know? And then we have the famous standard, which... I mean, most people are, you know, so it's funny because they don't define it as if you're not one of the other, your standard, you have to meet everything except the SIM. The SIM is the log system, a centralized log system that will take logs from all your system and put them all into a centralized. It costs quite a lot. So most of the small firm don't do this. What I was personally surprised to see is endpoint detection and response with EDR that is there and is not if you're in business and you want to keep your company safe, do this. Don't avoid doing the EDR. It's, it's the best thing ever, and we can cover that later. And finally, public company, you know, large, huge company where they have to do everything. So that's helping to see where you stand. 
some of our clients that are limited exam, they decide to do, do the full. They say, look, I'm in Buckler. I see all this. It's all best practices in cybersecurity. I want to protect my firm. I'm not trying to do the less. I want to do the most that I can, you know, to protect myself. Well, this is this is a lot, Vincent. What 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 should you know? <laughs> um, you know, most of the firms on here, I think, are pretty savvy and smart, and they can they can go through this. But this is a lot. So, what should we do next? What do I need to think about as my options and next steps? Yeah. So, I mean, it's in twenty six days. You know, so for April fifteen is coming really really quick. So, I'm gonna try to do a circle of what needs to be done. Okay. So what regulation? You have to ask yourself, am I only in New York DFS? Do I have an exemption or a limited exemption? Am I covered by another regulators, which is SEC, NAIC, also in, uh, in insurance? Do I receive some documents from my home office, You know, either a broker dealer or an insurance carrier or somebody you're affiliated with? As an example, Schwab say you need insurance. OK, you need cyber insurance, I'm sorry. So uh, you may be with a broker dealer that would provide the documents. And also some of our clients, they come with their policies that they invested to develop. So there's a mix there to understand at least what is that I have to meet and what is that I did already. And then you have to customize your program. And I think that's where people have a challenge. They look at the regulation and they say, yeah, but can I do that? Should I do this? So it depends. As an example, there's a rule that said, if you develop software, you need to do software penetration testing. Okay, but if I don't develop software, I don't have to do this. Uh, do I process credit card? I have to be PCI compliant. Do I have field offices? Then I need to audit them annually. So there's a lot of customization based on who you are and what kind of business you run. When you're done with this, you're going to do the gap analysis. So you're going to take all the requirements from your DFS and you say, yes, I'm doing it. It's implemented. And not just that I have a policy. Can I prove that it's implemented? And then you're going to go and just look at all these different sectors in, the, in the, the regulation and say, what do I do and what I don't? And then you're going to have a filing document ready, which is exactly what I said earlier. What do I meet? What I don't? And when I'm going to remediate? You're going to meet your, with your senior leadership and explain to them what is this report, and then you're going to go file online. You know, So that that what needs to be done. Some people take the risk. They say, I'm just not going to file, but understand that it's a legal risk that you take now. It's not just, oh, I have, I have it's FINRA and you're there, or a CC, they can find me, but here it's a law. So you're against the law when you do this, you know. Thank you for outlining that, Vincent. It's It's helpful to see in one picture the map, the roadmap that needs to get done. Could you take a couple minutes, because you helped Box Professional go through this, your team helped us get this information. Can you give us a quick view of kind of how Buckler approaches it? You might, you know, someone yeah. on the phone might be saying, hey, I can do that all myself, but uh, give us a quick view. Yeah. So now you may imagine that we have a lot of new clients lately. And what I just described to you, that's what we do, what we do in Buckler. So we, you went through this chat, we interview you. We say, what are the regulations you have to meet? Then we have 20 questions about all your specific specification from your firm. And then boom, you have a cyber program. So it's not like you have to create it. So if I share my screen just to show you, you get yourself into the dashboard and you're like, day one, when you log in, you have your cyber program. So what is a cyber program? A list of policies and procedures, as I defined earlier, and tasks. So you have your main menu on the left, where you see all the different sections of the cyber regulation. And then you have your policies. And in this case, it's a demo environment. I have 247 policy. What we name policy is really a statement. And you see that some active policy, active, it's exactly what is in your cyber program. So if you export your cyber program, you have a PDF with the same table of content that I just show you in the menu, and you have all your policies. So it's a 30-page document that allow you to say, wow, finally, I have my, uh, my cyber program. So what's a policy in Buckler? So if I take my favorite, because you all have to do this annually, you have to do a network penetration testing and vulnerability scans. And now you're going to understand what we did at Buckler, which is unique, is the policy match. So now if you say, I have to do this, who's telling me that I have to do this? You're going to click here and you're going to see the copy paste from the regulations that tells you that you have to do an assessment from FINRA, from HIPAA, from New York DFS, and the 20 so uh, from SEC. From all the years when they say you have to do this, it's all tracked there. So then you have to do this. 
You see that's active, meaning it's in my plan. I have a policy owner. I can delegate the enforcement. And look here, I say that it's done annually. If it's done annually, you receive an email reminder that shows you you have to do something. So we basically build a system to cover all the definition of your policies and the management and evidence and tracking of that. So what's left, there's a big chunk that is left. If, if we say we put antivirus, somebody else needs to do that in your team or outsource. So there's all those safeguard and uh, protection that needs to be implemented. And the great thing, Vincent, when we went through this, a lot of these things we had done, I wish we could say we were perfect. There was a few things that we didn't, but we were able to put in there things we already done. So we weren't doing it two or three times, but yes. what we were really doing is organizing the information, making it clear, making it simple so we can confidently go in and attest to what we need to attest to with New York DFS. And by the way, at least for Box Professional, going through this process, not only did we meet that, but we are at a much stronger cyber compliance stance. We're, we're stronger because of it. So thank you for that. Thank, thank you for taking some time with us today. I know you're busy. You've got plenty of folks knocking on your door. Uh, I do want to say to those that have joined us, you know, the, the best thing you can do is take a moment and think, you know, where am I at? Where, what do I need to get done? Uh, Vincent's been great and provided us essentially with an email, he's got a self-assessment uh, that, that he can send and you can do a self-assessment if, you know, for no cost, just help you kind of guide through it. You can, he's got, his team has any number of levels of support that they can provide depending on what you specifically need. So, so hopefully you feel more confident, be able to assess where you're at, think about what that looks like. And what we're going to be doing just, just to help out is uh, you may get a call from someone at Box, Box Professional Insurance. And just to make sure that you've got everything you need, we hope all of you, if your clients are not, that you're well taken care of, uh, you're protected. And, and uh, in, the, in the unlikely event of hopefully you don't get a cyber attack, but if you do, that you're able to recover quickly and continue forward. Thank you so much, Chad. And thank you, everybody, for joining. Have a great day.